Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. All right, Luke chapter 18. So far we've been in Matthew in this parable series. In Luke, typically, the parables, some of them overlap with Matthew. The parables are a little bit more colorful in Luke. He usually gives us a little more details, but this parable is shorter than the few we went through in Matthew, which is different than normal. But there's, there's 46 parables in the New Testament that Jesus told us. We're only getting to look at five of them in this series. And I, I don't know if y'all have enjoyed it so far. It's blown me away as God is choosing to use these illustrations to reveal to some and conceal from others the truth that he wants people to see. We're going to pick up in Luke chapter 18 verse 9. Jesus as he's teaching at this point is moving from helping people understand the nature of the kingdom of God to now helping them understand if they're really in the kingdom of God or not. Okay? And for many and I think for some of us in this room, there's an illusion. There's an illusion. You're not seeing your standing before God correctly. Here we go. Verse 9. He also told them this parable. We've said a parable is a narrative analogy showing us a spiritual reality, right? A, a narrative analogy showing us a spiritual reality. So we're going to ask God to help us see supernaturally through this parable. He told them a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, this is the way they saw themselves, and treated others with contempt. We'll come back to Luke's comments on it, but let's see what Jesus tells us. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. Notice they're going up. There's, 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 there's spatial parts to this parable that are, are beautiful, okay? But it, the, the, these two men go up to pray. Only one is going to come down right with God. These two men go up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Now, the kids uh, up front, probably many of them have been in church and they understand this. When, when you read in our Bible, Pharisee, what do you think? Bad, typically, right? If, if you've grown up in church, you hear about Pharisees, you typically think bad. It was the opposite for the audience that Jesus was teaching. The Pharisee was the one who was reading the Bible more than anyone else there. The Pharisee was the one who was going to church more than anyone else there. The Pharisee was the one who was obeying God more than anyone else there. In fact, as you think about our church mission statement, rescuing one another from cultural Christianity to follow Jesus every day. Now this is, again, before the church started, Jesus had died on the cross. But if you were to, like, who is following God every day? You know who it would be? The Pharisee. And then he says, and there was a tax collector. Now again, because Jesus wants to flip paradigms on their head, we read this and we think, well, the, the tax collector is probably going to be a good guy because often in the stories that Jesus told we think that but that's not the way the original audience would have seen this okay the original audience saw tax collectors as those people who had turned their back on the kingdom of God Israel and was now serving Rome which would have in most of their minds even if what they were doing was above board financially they would have seen that as wrong because they are serving the wrong king Caesar and they, so this is what this person was serving Rome but they would go and they would take money from the people of Israel and bring them to the Romans and then often keep some for themselves we know that from other parables and other stories in the New Testament so these people were cheating people out of money and serving another king. So when Jesus starts this parable, there's these two men going up to pray. Everyone would have thought, oh, there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. And watch, watch what the good guy prays. 
And by the way, I think, I think the Pharisee, he gets thrown under the bus when this parable is taught or commented on way too much. Uh, his prayer is a great looking prayer. Uh, his, his prayer is very theocentric. Yes, it's got five eyes in it, but look who he's thanking for those five eyes. It's God. Look what, he, look what he prays. Look what he prays. Verse 11, the Pharisee standing by himself. A lot of people say he was trying to show off with this prayer. Notice that he's by himself. At this point in time, I'll talk to you a little bit more later about what was going on in the synagogue. He's not grandstanding. He, he, he's not saying, I hope everybody hears me right now. I'm better than everybody else. No, he's off by himself and he prays. Watch, thank you, God. This, this starts out like a psalm. We're going to be in the psalm starting in a few weeks. It's going to be great. We're going to be going through the. We thought about naming the series the Summer Psalms, and that was too complicated, and we didn't. But we're going to be spending the summer in the psalms. And this starts out like a worship song. Thank you, God. And watch what he thanks God for. He says, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men, extortioners, uh, people that would uh, cheat people out of money, unjust, people who would break the law, adulterers, people who would cheat on their spouse. Thank you, God, that I'm not like those people. Now we read that and we start thinking, well, he's super, but, but let's, let's dig into this a little bit more because I think a lot of us are actually there and we think we're doing the right thing. There's, there's some good in this prayer. There's, he, he, he is, he's basically saying, God, if it was not for you, who knows where I'd be? Who knows? God, thank you that, that I'm doing the right thing. And then he goes off and says, and I love, this is what people, or even like this tax collector. People are like, well, he's throwing somebody under the bus. You've done that. So have I. I, I, I was hanging out with a couple outside of our church before you feel like I'm insulting someone here in this room recently. And we, we met, we did lunch, and we left. And I thought, God, thank you that my wife is not like her. <laughs> I actually thought that. And then I went around to, and God, thank you that I'm not treating my wife like he's treating her. And I start realizing, oh my goodness, right? Now, is that a bad prayer? Thank you, God. No, I don't think that's a, necessarily a bad prayer. What's, what's here? Jesus will show us later. I mean, this, get this. I mean, this is the kind of guy that I want my, my daughters to bring home one day, right? So he talks about what he's doing morally, now verse 14, in his prayer, again, thanking God. He's going to talk about what he's doing spiritually. He says, I go to church twice a month. No, that's not what he says. Okay? Uh, he says, God, I thank you that I read my Bible on occasion. No, that's not, this is not just normal spiritual stuff. This is varsity Christianity. Okay, this guy is is he's he is walking with God, I would dare say, closer than anyone else in this room. If you were to look on the outside. Do you see what he says? I fast twice a week. Do you see this? Old Testament law only required one fast a year on the Day of Atonement. And this guy's taking it, and he's blowing it out of the water. He's fasting twice a week. Anybody here doing that? Don't raise your hand. You're going to get rewards taken away. Hey, it, what? What, it, I, I give tithes of all that I get. Now, okay, the, the, what, what, he, what he's saying here, he, he's saying I give tithes of... Now, now put this in... in uh, for, for, first start there, and we'll go here. For, for this, this man, what this probably meant was when I get money... I'm going to tithe from my money, and then I'm going to go and purchase crops so that I can eat them. And then when I receive those crops, I'm going to then take half or 10% of what I have bought with the money that I had already tithed from, and I'm going to bring that and tithe with that also. Like In, in, I, I, in today's world, maybe that would be like, okay, you're tithing 10%, and then 
with the money you tithed, tithed, you are getting a tax return. And then you're taking that tax return and you're tithing on top of that, right? This is a great, I would love for him to be in our church, right? Right. Uh, this, but he looks great. And you all think, well, thank this, I would want this guy to disciple me, right? He looks like he's walking with God. I, w- I would want to. I would want to hang out with him, except on the days he's fasting, <laughs> right? And we throw him under the bus. Go. Cool. So th- here's that guy. Verse thirteen, the second man. But the tax collector, standing far off would not even lift up his eyes. This man has done a lot wrong. Kids, uh, I don't know if you remember, I remember several times with my father when I had done the wrong thing, and he would say, Sam, look at me. You remember this? But because I knew I had done something wrong, I didn't want to look at Dad. This man... He says, verse 13, standing far off, again, he's separated from the crowd like the other man was, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. The first guy is comparing himself to other people. This man is comparing himself to God. Note, he wouldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. More accurately translated, the sinner. This man, he's not looking to God. He's beating his breast. The, uh, uh, Paul says that godly sorrow leads to repentance. There's this grieving in his life going on. He won't even look up at God. And he says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Verse 14. If only half of verse 14 was there, this would be a feel-good parable. If, If verse 14 ended at the comma... This, this parable would be one that I would have enjoyed studying a little bit more than I did this week. But I want, I, want you to see, I want you to see what he says. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Okay, stop here for just a second. This is wonderful. This is great. This is grace. This is what we believe. You're here and you're saying, yes, I know this is part of who God is. He sent his son to die on the cross for sinners. That's what it is. It's grace. It's beautiful. It's wonderful, right? He, God, God justified this man. He justified this man. He was saved, but it doesn't end there. There's a comma, and then it says, uh, John Piper says, Four of the most terrifying words in the New Testament for cultural Christians. He says, rather than the other. Rather than the other. Sometimes the Bible is not super fun to read. But it's something we need to read so that our illusion can be corrected. The man who was doing all the good things was not right with God. Uh, if you want to go farther into what this is, the, 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 the first man who prayed, thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, that I, I'm doing all these good things, that man is going to hell. What's the opposite of justified, condemned? What is he missing? What might I, we, be missing? Well, Jesus comments, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, 
But the one who humbles himself will be, what's the word there? Exalted. All right, if you're taking notes, let's try to dig into what this parable is saying. Okay, uh, this, this, we, we view our lives as an illusion. And spiritually, we, 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 so many of us don't actually see where we stand before God correctly. And I'm, I'm gonna, that this, he who humbles himself will be exalted, and he who exalts himself will be humbled, and we're going to play on the words of he went up and came down, okay? And here, here's, here's the way we're going to title, or the main point, and then we're going to talk about how it falls out. Okay, the way up is down, okay? The way up is down. Uh, Luke actually gives commentary on what Jesus is saying through this parable, that those who exalt themselves will be humbled, to humble themselves and be exalted in that, that verse right before verse 9. So I'm going to go back to that verse and I'm going to point out to you the two things that were wrong in this person's life. And then I want us to ask ourselves, is that wrong in my life? Okay, go back to verse 9. He said, he told them a parable to some who, first thing, trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And second thing, treated others with contempt. Okay, you see the two things there? Y'all are probably thinking, wow, sure I'm glad I came to church today. This is like gut punch. Jesus' parables were intended to sink in deep. Gut punch. Okay? Because I think the first point, trusted, is his main point, and I'll show you why in a minute. I want to, I want to touch on the second one first, and then we'll go back to what I think is the primary point. Okay? Are we treating others with contempt? So apply number one, treat. I want to read you a, a quote related to the way up is down, the way down is up. This is St. Augustine. Do you wish to rise? Begin by descending. You plan a tower that will pierce the clouds. Lay first the foundation of humility. Isn't that, that beautiful? You want to rise, begin by descending. This is not the way that the United States of America thinks when it comes to business, and I would say the way we think when it comes to church. How are we treating other people? Apply number one, treat. Lift up others, not yourself. Luke points out that Jesus was speaking this parable to people who treated others with contempt. We need to lift up others, not ourself. The only other place in the New Testament where we read the words from Jesus, he who humbles himself will be exalted and exalted himself will be humbled. Here, go with me. It's, it's just a few chapters before. This is Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Watch how he tells us to relate to other people when it comes to showing us the way up is down. Watch what he says. Chapter 14, verse 7, he says, Now he told them a parable to those who were invited, and he noticed how they chose places of honor. They were putting themselves in the high position, not the low position. And he said to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Verse 10, but when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. You see what he's telling them? He's saying socially, you want, to be, you want to be treating other people the right way? The way up is down. That's what he says. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone, here it is, exact words that he says in the, next, the parable we're studying today. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And to he who humbles himself, he who humbles himself will be exalted. How are you treating other people? Do you walk in a room seeking to lift yourself up? Which is, if you're doing that, you're treating others with contempt and you don't even know it. Or lifting up others. Proverbs is strong on this, right? Pride comes before what? A fall. The fall. Problem with pride is it's a blind spot for us, isn't it? We don't see it. Uh, as I was studying this parable this week, again, super convicted and scared, uh, 
I started doing something that was not fun that I want to challenge you to do. And that, that is I want you to go and I want you to ask people that are close to you, how am I treating others with contempt? How am I functioning pridefully? And I'm going to tell you a few things that were said back to me that were not fun to hear. Okay? Maybe you need to ask your spouse. Maybe you need to ask your kids. Maybe you need to ask a coworker at work. Um, the answer I heard most from a coworker here and also from my wife is that when I think I know what's right, I don't really listen when someone else is telling me what they think. And that's gross. That's gross. What about you? Okay, that's the first thing that was said. The second thing that was said is I don't always think before I talk. And when I talk, I'm trying to get my way. You know what happens is I'm treating others with contempt. And Jesus, Luke tells us, spoke to people like me. So I want to challenge you to ask someone in your life. C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity, as long as you're proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and looking down on people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Back to the prayer of the Pharisee. I think that's the thing. If you want to look at that prayer, that's probably wrong. He does thank God, but right after saying thank you, God, he looks down on other people. Lift up others, not yourself. Lift up others. What if we recognize that the way down is up? As we transition to the next point, I want to say this. If you've showed up at churches and you're here in the room and maybe you've never really connected to a church or really you're here first timer today and you feel like you have to stand far off because of what you've done, uh, if you feel like others here would look down on you, I just want to say I'm so thankful you're here. Because this parable actually would show us if we, if we really weren't looking through an illusion, you're actually closer to God than someone who would say, I'm better. If you walk into a church and you feel unworthy, you're closer to God than someone who feels like they are, okay? Now, how does that look but through the blood of Christ? We're going to get to that in just a second because we don't have to show up here afraid we're going to hell every day. Praise God, right? But I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here, and I want to invite you into our family with your mess, being an extortioner, being unjust, being an adulterer, and say, bring that in here. Whatever that looks like, You've gotten fired at work because you did something wrong. If you recognize you've done something wrong, you're ready to repent and follow Jesus, guess what? You're in the right place. And you're going to help us. Cheated on your wife, you're in your fourth marriage, you're whatever that looks like. And you don't even want to lift your eyes up because you feel unworthy. You're in the right place. Okay? You hear that? Okay. So, the way up is down first. Treat, he says, treated others with contempt. And then also, first thing he says, to some who trusted, 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 trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They didn't just have a treating problem. They had a tr trusting problem. Trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You know, Jesus in Luke chapter 5 calls Levi. You know what Levi's profession was? He was a tax collector. He calls Levi to follow him to be his disciple, a man who was a sinner in the eyes of the world. And immediately we see this party happening at Levi's house, and Pharisees show up. And Jesus says to that group, guess what? He says, I did not come to save the well, but the sick. Those who are well have no need for a physician. If you think 
that you're doing everything right. And because of what you're doing right, you have right standing before God. You're in trouble because you think you're well based on what you do. Even if you think the reason you're doing the things you're doing is because God has loved you and been gracious to you so that you could do those things you're doing and then somehow earn right standing before God based on what you do. So many cultural Christians find their identity, their, their right standing before God and what they don't do compared to other people morally. I'm not legalistic. I'm, I'm not getting drunk every day. I'm not, uh, I'm not struggling with that sexual deal, the, either the looking at the pictures or my, on my wife or identity issue or I'm not there. I'm not, I haven't divorced eight times. I haven't, I'm, I'm not a poor handler of money. I'm, I'm a good boss. I try to be there for my family. Do you understand if that's where your identity is found? It's an illusion. It's an illusion. Not just on what you don't do, but maybe what you are doing religiously. Yeah, I go to the worship service that's more emotionally connected to God. Or I go to the one that's more doctrinally sound. Or I, 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 I what I do in my relationship with God, I have a quiet time every day. I, I pray two hours each morning. I'm not saying I do that, by the way. If that's where your identity is found, there's trouble. But guess what? Guess what? Okay, I want to go back to what was happening in the temple. What was happening in the temple. It says they went up to the temple to pray. There were two times during the day that people would go up to the temple. Y'all with me? Okay. Back 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. That you would go up to the temple to pray at dawn, which was around 6 a.m., depending on the time of year, to pray. Or you could go up to the temple. Most wouldn't go both times. Some Pharisees did, obviously. Go up to the temple at 3 o'clock to pray. And you know what you would see happen? What you would see happen is you would see the priest come out and sacrifice a lamb in front of you. And that lamb was the atonement sacrifice symbolic of the blood covering the sin of God's people, Israel. And they would sacrifice the lamb. There would be some burning of incense, some other things that would happen. And then they would turn it over then for the people to have personal prayer. That's what would happen in the temple. And so what, what, what the Pharisee and this tax collector have just seen, the good guy and the bad guy, is someone kill a lamb and say, this lamb is going to cover the sin of people. And you know what the response of the one who's justified is? The one who's justified is the one who's all the way down. I mean, he he's, he's can't even lift his eyes up before God. He's not high up. Yes, God, I'm doing the right thing. He's down before God and he's saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's saying, I plead the blood of the Lamb. I plead the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb is my only hope. The blood of the Lamb is my only hope. And you know what happens is that man leaves that day right with God. Where are you? I told Carrie, I loved the, I saw the light. The words in the song, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. Then like a blind man... God gave me back his sight. Praise the Lord. What does he say? I saw the light. That's right. I saw the light. The illusion is removed when the view of the blood of the Lamb, with us, the way down is up. Not saying, God, I'm making it up the mountain on my own. It's have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Why do I think it's the main point of the passage? Well, he talks about justification in the passage. Then watch what he says next. I'm cheating. I'm re reading into the next few verses here. But watch what he says. Verse 15. 
Now they're bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the little children come to me. Kids, Jesus loves you. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Verse 17, truly, watch this, verse 17 again. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, the way down is up. He does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. How does a child get anything? Okay, I'm intimately acquainted with this right now. We just dedicated three, three uh, parents here up front, families that are intimately acquainted. The way a child gets something is this. Ah! Okay, the, the way the child gets out of crib. Ah, wait, daddy. Ah, wait. I come, daddy comes and gets them. The way, the way a child gets food. Daddy, I'm hungry. Oh, that's the way, the way a child gets a toy. Daddy, I want a toy. And then we discipline and we still give him the toy. I mean, that's just the way it happens, right? Ah, 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 ah. And, and we don't get that so many of us are delusioned into thinking, no, the way we get what God wants to offer us is by going up and earning our way. If that's where you are, you're seeing an illusion. The only way is have mercy on me. The, 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 the cry from this tax collector is in the passive tense, which means he's asking God to do something to him. He's not talking about what he can do. Are you on some high horse? I see it in my life and it scares me so often. The way up is down. I'll show you another illusion picture here. This is the first one we saw. Doesn't it look like it's moving? It's a bog- I've never seen that one before this week, by the way. But it's not. Pray with me. Are you right now, through the word of God, seeing something that you had not seen? I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe you are. If that's you. If you're realizing that you've treated others with contempt, I just want you to invite you to just confess that to God. If you've been trusting in yourself what you do or what you don't do, maybe even comparing that to other people, confess that to God. And you know how to receive him like a child? You just cry out. And you say, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. The word there for mercy is actually a Hebrew word that's been translated into the Greek to cover. And your life is not put on display. And what happens is he covers up your life with the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. All you've done is not something to earn position, favor, so that you can get right with God. And the blood of Jesus covers you. You're perfect before God. So plead the blood of the Lamb right now. Say, God, cover me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.